Good morning, Year 9, and uh, welcome to lesson number two of week nine. Um, we're going to be uh, continuing our journey in looking at health and disease, and we are going to be looking at discovering drugs. So, uh, ones that have already uh, been discovered, and also uh, some of the potential uh, medicines for the future. So from last lesson, which was on uh, antibiotics and painkillers, um, can you complete one of the following tasks? So can you either define uh, three keywords from last lesson? So perhaps what a painkiller is, what an antibiotic is, etc. Or can you put down three key points from last lesson, just in a summary sentence, or summarize the whole of the last lesson in a single paragraph and once you've done that if you could do it from memory first but once you've done that go back and have a look at your notes from last lesson and see whether you got all of the things uh, that you needed so pause the video and do that now so what do we need to know from this lesson so we need to be able to name some of the drugs uh, that based on extracts that we've taken from plants and microorganisms, and also know the uh, order of events that led to the production of penicillin. Five six, we need to describe how new antibiotics are tested, and also uh, think about the advantages and disadvantages of looking for new drugs. Um, for seven to eight, we need to suggest why mold naturally produces antibiotics, and discuss how effective herbal remedies are. So you don't need to write any of this down, but it just gives you a little bit of background on the history of medicines. And some of our early examples um, uh, in human history is in ancient Egypt, uh, where they actually used mouldy bread um, on septic wounds. So septic means that it has become infected. Uh, by bacteria. So they would have mouldy bread to these septic wounds. Um, and that's actually one of the early examples of using antibiotic treatments. Now, because it's very hot and dry in Egypt, it meant that we were able to uh, analyse discoveries uh, so that we could actually see how sophisticated these techniques are, considering it came obviously in ancient civilization. <clears throat> now, there was a lot of uh, magic and ritual as well used with ancient Egyptians, uh, which wouldn't have had an effect on um, treating somebody of their diseases, but they kind of went together in these rituals um, with the idea that it would heal people. So, uh, apart from using mouldy bread, the ancient Egyptians also used other uh, natural remedies, so herbs and fruits and things like that, that they used to treat certain ailments. And actually, some of them we still use in uh, modern medicine. So even though it was thousands of years ago, um, uh, we've come up with industrial ways in which we can get concentrated forms of certain compounds found in herbs and things like that, uh, that we can actually use in treatment. So uh, what I would like you to do now is there's going to be a list of some different um, natural remedies that ancient Egyptians used. Um, you can see those at the bottom. So we've got honey, uh, we've got willow, we've got mint, and we have got pomegranates, uh, which are a fruit. So what I would like you to do is you're going to exit this uh, PowerPoint, and I would like you to very quickly go and do some, your own research into how honey, willow, uh, mint and pomegranate can be used to treat ailments. It doesn't need to be uh, extensive research, just a quick uh, Google reading some of the articles and just jot down um, some of the uh, treatments that we can use uh, these for. Okay, so hopefully we've gone around away and done our own research on that. Um, you might have found out uh, that honey is actually a really good antiseptic. Uh, so that means that it kills or reduces the growth of bacteria. And it's quite often used to treat wounds. 
Um, it's a very ancient cure um, and actually is used quite a lot by the British military to treat burns. You might have heard of uh, something called Manuka honey, uh, which is meant to be uh, very, very good at killing or slowing down the growth of bacteria. Uh, it's one example, but honey uh, is a good antiseptic. Another one uh, that quite a lot of you have probably used um, in your life at some point is willow. So the willow tree uh, in the bark, you'll actually form, uh, you'll actually find, sorry, um, a compound which they use now to make aspirin. Mint, um, uh, quite often used to treat gastric ailments. So if you've got an upset tummy, things like that. Um, uh, and mint is another cure that's still used today. So people will often uh, use mint if they have uh, any gastric ailments. And the final one, pomegranate, um, uh, which is quite interesting, is used to treat infestations of parasitic worms. So uh, they found that it's got a high amount of a chemical called tannin, um, and that actually paralyzes worms in the digestive tract um, uh, and actually uh, get rid of them. So you would just pass them through uh, with your feces. Okay, so uh, there are certain ones that we do need to know for the specification. Uh, there are in fact three. Uh, we're going to go over two of them now. I'd like you to put down the uh, name of the uh, where it comes from, so either the plant or the tree, and then uh, what it's used for um, in modern medicine. So uh, the first one, it actually comes from foxgloves, and you probably know that foxgloves are incredibly poisonous if you eat any of the parts of the plant, but in uh, low doses, um, it was actually discovered uh, that it would treat things like uh, if you have a very weak heartbeat, but also a ailment called dropsy, which is where you have a large amount of uh, fluid retention in your body. Uh, so you would take the digitalis, uh, which is the name of the drug that comes from foxgloves, and it would actually get rid of that excess uh, liquid that is being held in your tissues. But as I say, large amounts of it um, is very poisonous. So can you put down uh, foxgloves, which gives us digitalis, and that it's used to strengthen the heartbeat and to treat dropsy. So pause the video and pop down the first one. Okay, next one. Uh, which we did mention in the research one, is willow trees. So uh, in willow trees, uh, you find a compound uh, that is acetyl salicylic acid, uh, which is commonly known as aspirin. So we get aspirin from willow trees, and that's used to relieve pain and inflammation. So uh, quite often people take it for headaches, things like that, or if they have any inflammation caused by infections. And one of the ways in which they uh, discovered it is that when they would eat the tail glands of beavers, uh, which you don't find in England anymore, but they used to be around, um, they actually had a lot of uh, pain relief. So uh, they realized that it must be coming from something that they'd eaten, uh, bark was quite often used in early medicine uh, to relieve pain. And now we know that it comes from this compound called acetyl, uh, acetyl, sorry, salicylic acid. So if we could pop the next one down. So it comes from willow trees. Uh, it gives us aspirin and that is used to relieve pain and inflammation. So pause the video and pop that down. <clears throat> okay, now you don't need to write any of these down. Uh, we have spoken about a couple of them, uh, but also ones that you might be uh, familiar with. Um, we've talked about the willow causing a pain relief, but garlic as well is often consumed to 
prevent heart disease because it kind of works uh, as a blood thinner. We've also got a plant called St. John's Wort, and that's actually used to treat depression. Uh, we've spoken about foxglove, and that produces digitalis, which helps with heart conditions, neuropsy. Um, these are cranberries being picked uh, in America, I presume. They produce a lot of cranberries, um, and they're actually used as anti-cancer agents. Uh, so they're high in antioxidants, uh, which actually uh, reduce the risk of cancers, some cancers. And another one is uh, opium, which comes from poppies. And that is used uh, to help people sleep and also as an anesthetic. Opium, heroin, things like that were all used in medicine first until they realised uh, that it was highly addictive. So before we move on to the third and final drug that we need to know about, which we've talked about a lot and you would have come across a lot, uh, is penicillin, which is a type of antibiotic. We're actually going to think about why is that we uh, uh, synthesise, so that means to uh, man-make, synthesise drugs instead of using the plant extracts directly. So instead of going out and getting the plant and giving that to the patient. Now, uh, in the question, uh, the command word is suggest. And if you see suggest, it means that they don't expect you to know the answer, uh, but it's using your knowledge to kind of think about uh, reasons for something. So the question is, suggest reasons for using synthetic forms of drugs, man-made drugs, rather than using plant extracts directly. And it's going to be worth four marks. So if you could pause the video, and have a go at answering that question. Okay, so hopefully you've had a stab at that. Um, it's going to be worth four marks, so I'm going to give a selection of some uh, different things that you might have spoken about, and then see if you have uh, suggested those. So first of all, plant extracts may be impure, so that means that uh, it's not just going to contain the uh, chemical that you want. You might have said that it's only found in small amounts in plants. Um, now, if, because it's in small amounts, it means that you would have to grow loads and loads of the plant uh, in order to extract the drug. So that's going to be another point. Synthetic drugs can be made industrially in large amounts. So if we are making it in factories, we can produce lots of it. We can also change the molecules, so uh, we can actually change it to make it better um, or better absorbed and things like that. And the last one, chemists can make drugs that are more effective and have less side effects. So the ones that we can synthesize in uh, laboratories can have less side effects than uh, the ones that you would get naturally. So. Uh, Hopefully you mentioned some of those different things. You might have put uh, other valid points on there. Uh, that's absolutely fine. But these are some of the uh, suggestions that came to mind uh, from this question. So give yourself a mark out for on that. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, um, discovering uh, penicillin or the discovery of penicillin. And uh, it wasn't until sort of 1945 um, uh, that we were able to mass produce penicillin. So before that time, uh, a lot of people would die from bacterial infections. And it was a very, very important discovery uh, that saved many, many, many lives. In the early 20th century, scientists were looking for chemicals that could actually yet kill bacteria um, and cure infectious diseases. But as I say, it wasn't until uh, the 1940s they actually uh, produced the drug that we know now as penicillin. And the people that actually uh, were associated with the discovery were given a Nobel Prize for medicine because it was such an important discovery. And you've probably heard of Alexander Fleming, uh, but there was also Flory and Chain uh, in the USA who were involved in its production as well. So on the next slide, 
Um, I've got the story of how penicillin was discovered and developed, <clears throat> but they're not in the correct order. So the first thing I would like you to do is read through the cards that are going to come up and arrange them into the correct order. Now you don't need to write down everything that's on the cards, just put down the number um, in the correct order. Then just read back through it, make sure that it makes sense. And then we're going to talk about three uh, questions that are what we need to take away from those discoveries, which is describe how Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. So how did he actually uh, discover penicillin, that it had an effect? Number two is explain why it was so difficult to make a medicine out of penicillin. So why is it that it uh, took a little bit of time uh, to actually get penicillin uh, being produced? And number three, who developed the industrial process that made it possible to mass produce penicillin? Now these questions aren't going to be on the next slide, so I would suggest that you would pause this video now pop down the questions and a small amount of space underneath each one. They're not long uh, answers, so that you can answer them after you've put them in the correct order. Okay, so we're going to move on now. And here are the 10 different stages of the uh, discovery of penicillin. So what I would like you to do is pause the video and you're going to read through the statements and then you're going to try and put those in a logical uh, order uh, to show the process that happened in the discovery of penicillin. As I said in the previous slide, you do not need to write down everything that is in the boxes. Uh, you just need to put the numbers in the correct order. And then after you've done that, have a go at answering those three questions that you've written down. Okay, pause the video now then. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at that. Um, it was a reasonable amount of reading, so uh, well done. And hopefully we have got an order uh, of which the uh, discovery and the development of the drug, uh, how it took place. So here is the correct order. So uh, first one is number seven. Alexander Fleming was a microbiologist who worked at St Mary's Hospital in London. So just a little introduction to Alexander Fleming. The next one is number three. In 1928, he was growing a number of bacterial colonies as part of his investigations to look for chemicals that might kill bacteria and cure infectious diseases. So he was, had lots of petri dishes containing lots of bacteria in his lab. The next one is number four. He was quite a careless scientist um, and he often forgot to put the lids on the top of his culture plates, on top of those petri dishes. So they were just left out with no lid on. Now, next one is number five. So after returning from a holiday, Fleming noticed that a number of his culture plates had mould growing on them. So those spores had gotten onto the plates and the mould had started growing. Next one is number 10. So Fleming observed that there was that where the mould was growing, there was a clear ring in the jelly. Uh, the bacteria had been killed. So uh, in these petri dishes, you would have agar jelly, which grows the bacteria. Um, and he found that where the mould was growing, there was actually no bacteria surrounding it. Next up is number eight. So Fleming named a substance that killed the bacteria penicillin. And the reason for that is penicillium uh, was the mould that produced it. However, after several years, he gave up trying to extract the penicillin from the mould. So after he discovered the penicillin uh, was producing this penicillin that was killing the bacteria, he really struggled in getting that chemical out of the mould. In the late 1930s, two other scientists, so this is where we bring in the other two, Ernest Chain and Howard Florey, uh, successfully managed to extract penicillin from the penicillium mould. 
So it was actually these two scientists that took that idea um, and actually came up with the technique of getting penicillin out of the mould. Next one is number two. Eventually, Chain, Flory and their team managed to grow enough mould to extract sufficient penicillin to test on eight mice. So this is normally the kind of first stage of uh, clinical or trials rather, um, where you would test on animals. Uh, the mice were injected with a deadly bacteria. So the bacteria that they injected them was called streptococci. Four of the mice were then given penicillin. After 24 hours, uh, the mice that had received penicillin were healthy and the four that didn't have the penicillin uh, actually died. So the next one is number six. And we're in the 40s now. So in 1941, the team had enough penicillin to start human trials. Uh, the penicillin was given to a man dying from a blood infection. Uh, after four days of treatment, he significantly recovered. Uh, and that demonstrated that penicillin could be used to treat bacterial infections in humans successfully. However, they did not have enough penicillin and their supply ran out and the uh, patient actually relapsed and died. And the uh, final one is number nine. So Florian Chain worked in the USA pharmaceutical work company, uh, Pfizer, and they actually uh, managed to make penicillin on an industrial scale, eventually uh, producing enough of the drug to supply the demand for World War II. And even today, penicillin is widely used in treating bacterial infections. We do have um, other antibiotics that we've discovered since then, uh, but penicillin was a massive uh, contributor in treating uh, the wounded in World War II and obviously people today. So hopefully we got a order that was similar to that. That is the discovery. There were three questions. So uh, um, we will talk about those in the next slide. So I've gone back to the previous slide that had those three questions that we need to know. Uh, so question number one is describe how Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. So uh, that is when he left out his bacterial cultures, um, uh, went away and then came back, found that mould had grown on it and um, that there was no bacteria around the mould. Number two, explain why it was so difficult to make a medicine out of penicillin. Well done if you put down that it was very hard to extract penicillin from the mould. And number three, who developed the industrial uh, process that made it possible to mass produce penicillin? That was Florian Chain when they were working for the company Pfizer. Okay. So uh, that is some of the big discoveries that we need to know about. So we need digitalis, aspirin, and uh, penicillin. Um, but also something to think about is the future for medicines. So uh, spoken about before that we're starting to get antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria, uh, which cause huge amounts of problems. So uh, there's a big push and there's a lot of research into looking for new antibiotics because we only have a certain number of antibiotics. So once the bacteria become resistant to those, uh, we won't be able to treat them anymore. So there's a lot of research into uh, ways in which we can come up with new antibiotics. So uh, there's a couple of case studies that I've included on this PowerPoint. So the first one is the noni fruit. Uh, you don't need to write any of this down, by the way. So the uh, noni fruit is quite often used in traditional medicine in Costa Rica, um, and it's often used to treat infections and also non-communicable diseases. And it will often be put in food and drink, it has done for a very, very long time. And they've actually uh, discovered that it has got some antibiotic properties. So they're doing a lot of research now into trying to find the right compound in the noni fruit uh, that we can then use as an antibiotic or for other medicines. Another one 
uh, is soil microbes. So uh, there is a huge, huge number of microbes in soil, but only about 1% of them can actually be grown in the lab. So uh, scientists are developing um, special ways in which they can grow these microbes in a controlled way. And they've actually discovered that there is uh, a microbe that produces an antibiotic that kills uh, the bacteria that causes MRSA. Now you might have heard of MRSA. It is a antibiotic resistant form of a very common bacteria that causes uh, infections. And it was uh, a big thing a couple of decades ago uh, where it caused big issues in hospitals, still does. Uh, it's why they introduce the uh, alcohol gels and things like that in hospitals because a lot of people were going to hospital for normal procedures, routine procedures, actually getting this infection and were dying. So from that, as I said, you don't need to know specific uh, drugs that are coming from uh, new research, but what you might be, might be asked or um, might be examined on, especially in the uh, level five and above, is suggesting sort of advantages and disadvantages of new antibiotic compounds. So we've got a question here, it's worth four marks. And it is talking about the noni fruit. So in the exam, you would be given information about it if it's asking for something specific. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of looking for new antibiotic compounds in living organisms based on the example of the noni fruit? So can you have a go at getting four marks in that answer? As it's four marks, I would suggest two advantages and two disadvantages. So pause the video, have a go at this last question, um, and then we'll go through the answers. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at that. I've put down some, um, some that came to my mind, uh, but you might have put some other valid points in there, which would be absolutely fine. So uh, advantages. So first of all, there is anecdotal evidence. That's people sort of telling each other about it. Um, and that saves trying lots of different plants. So instead of going out and researching or looking into uh, random plants uh, or random things, we actually know that the noni fruit uh, does have an effect. Long and widespread uses suggest few side effects. So it's being used, which means that it's probably not uh, having lots of side effects from it. So that would be another advantage. Some disadvantages, um, it can be quite difficult to source the material. So if it's growing in Costa Rica, obviously uh, there's only going to be a certain amount of it. Um, it's not very common in other places. Concentrations might be very low. So uh, even though it does have an effect, you will have to have a lot of it. And it can be difficult to isolate certain chemicals um, that have that antibiotic effect. So uh, hopefully we've got four points in there. As I say, um, it's quite an open question. So uh, you may have put other valid points in there, um, but hopefully you have got a couple of the ones that I've suggested. Okay, so that is it for this lesson. So very well done for taking part. It's quite a tricky subject. If any of you do history, um, I know that there's a lot of history of drugs which will be useful in this. I know that you do uh, scientists like Fleming, um, things like that in it, so that will definitely be an advantage. But what we all need to be able to do is name some of the drugs um, that we get from plants and microorganisms. So that's digitalis, aspirin, and penicillin. For five to six, we need to talk about, uh, be able to describe about the process of how they uh, developed antibiotics and how they tested for the effectiveness. So that was looking at uh, animal research. So they looked at the mice and then treated the guy who had sepsis. And for seven to eight, uh, suggest why mold naturally produces antibiotics. So why do you think uh, that they produce antibiotics in the first place? 
Um, I'll leave that to you to think about. And also uh, thinking about herbal remedies and how effective they are. So uh, that is it from uh, me today. Well done for uh, going through the lesson. Uh, I know there are some tricky things and it does seem like quite a lot to remember. Um, join me tomorrow for our next lesson. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.